back to the AM. I'm your host, Juliana. Today, for our fifth episode, we have special guest Ken Stringfellow. Ken is the founding member of the Posies and is also known for his work with REM and Big Star. Today, we speak to him from his home in France. All right. So, uh, I mean, how are you? Uh, you know, hanging in there. It's kind of like um, I'm trying to go on vacation. And like I just posted today, for me, like, I have so much work professionally, uh, which is a great thing. It's just that for me, vacation just means going from 16 hour days to eight hour days. So, but I'm on the beach. So as soon as we're done with this conversation, I'm, I'm out the door because the tide will be up, go for a swim. But uh, right now it's a little bit like, um, I just have a bunch of work I need to get off my desk so I can actually maybe almost sort of have a vacation, but it's going to take a while. What have you been working on? Uh, tons of productions, mixing, uh, playing on people's records. Um, what I'm doing while I'm here is, uh, uh, I've got a TV show theme I'm supposed to write and record and deliver. Um, it's only a minute long, so it's not that hard, but it's, you know, it's gotta be good. So that's kind of stressing me out because I, you know, it's, it's not something I can just whip off or it starts to feel like something I can, it starts to intimidate me a little bit just because it, it's, you know, something kind of more permanent in a way. Uh, I got, I'm singing on somebody's record tomorrow. There's a band from, believe it or not, from Venezuela who contacted me about singing on their record. Um, they're all expats basically now. They can't live in the country anymore, but um, they are from Venezuela. Uh, the other thing is an American thing. There's a music production that I'm going to mix the songs. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the producer, but all the music is being made somewhere else. So like, you know, there's the guitarist at his house and the singer at her house and the bass player at his house. So I'm just basically coordinating all that stuff. So I, each step, I got to listen to what the, that particular musician has sent me and go, okay, that's good. That's not so good. That try that again, blah, blah, or that's great. Send me the files. And then I put the files into a session and, and then I'm going to mix that later. Um, just stuff like that, you know, but the main thing is music production. And I, as a, as a, you know, as a mixer, meaning I put everything together or, uh, as a player, you know, like, and then, in, or, you know, I kind of create the whole track for somebody in a sense too, you know, where I, I make all the music except for the, the, the artist's voice and I fit everything around it. Um, and I know there's other stuff than that, but those are, those are kind of main categories. Of course, I'm an artist too, you know, and I have my own releases and our band is working on an album. So today I've got a, um, I've got a mix. Uh, we're not mixing our own album. I, we've kind of, I think for reasons of democracy, we've handed that task to someone else. And then we all, uh, approach him with our, well, they approach the band gives me what they want to change in the mixes and then I deliver that to the mixer, but it's a little bit equal. You always have the worry that maybe if your bandmate is mixing your, your band song, that maybe they're going to, you know, protect their interests over yours, um, you know, and make their parts sound louder or whatever. So I don't do that. We put, we give it to somebody else. Um, and so I've got to listen to mixes and make comments and whatnot and organize the comments of my bandmates. Uh, I know there's more stuff than that. It's just tons of stuff like that, you know, and, and getting work, you know, like I'm also, that's part of being a freelancer is, you know, you got to think about the calendar. So, um, trying to fill up the, I got a couple open dates, uh, in September, October, November, most of the calendar is full, but I got to, you know, I don't want to leave anything to chance one day, every day has to be busy. Um, and I have, I'm doing online concerts. That's another thing, um, you know, since live music is mostly suspended, um, that I have, uh, I gave an online concert last weekend and it was really, really good. It went super great. Um, lots of people tuned in. Um, it was, it, I made quite a nice amount of money and which is really helpful. Um, since you know how many in the touring income at this point. So uh, I'm doing another one of those on August 30th, um, which will be 
morning time here in Europe where I am because I want to include people who didn't see the last one because the last one was in the evening Europe time. So it was great for the Americans. You, they could watch it in the morning uh, live. Um, but people who are in Australia, New Zealand, uh, East Asia, all that kind of stuff, it was in the middle of the night for them. And some people complained. So I aim to please. So I'm doing the concert at an optimal time for those time zones. So there's promotion involved in that too. You're just reaching out to all my, you know, known mailing lists and fans. And I reach out to everybody one by one. Um, I found that has really good results. Then you just send out a mail blast and nobody cares. But if you message somebody about something, then you kind of put them on the spot, you know? Yeah. Um, last time uh, we spoke, we talked a little about the differences between like small venues, like when you were doing your tour touched. Mm. versus uh, larger venues. And so mm -hmm. in regards to the online concert that you just did, I was kind of curious to know how that atmosphere was compared to what we've typically experienced in live shows. Well, it's I'm, I can't really say from the audience's point of view, although the commentary was really good. People, um, people loved it. Um, you know, I have really no, I had no idea how it was really going to go. I hadn't done one of these before. I'd done some stuff fake live. You know, I'd, I'd been part of some music events online, but it was all, I recorded everything in advance and, and you know, mixed the audio and everything and sent them something kind of pre-produced. Um, you know, so it, in a way it's weird. It, all, all these online events are kind of a mix between performances and TV in a sense. You know, there are shows that are live, live, like Saturday Night Live. And then there's shows that are, you know, created in a studio and put together and edited and, you know, whatnot. And this mixes a little bit of those aspects. Um, the live, live show, the, 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 the first one, I think was really cool. I, like I said, I don't know what the audience really experienced, but, but the fact is, uh, it is different than taping something and people just watching it and they know that it's not live. But here the, in this platform that I'm using, which is called Connect Club, um, which is spelled the normal way except for Connect is spelled with a K. Um, well, starts with a K. Uh, there's some interaction involved. I mean, people can post comments that come up on, I see those comments and so does everybody else watching uh, and they can hit in a little applause button. So you see little emojis of hand, clapping hands float by. Uh, they can throw tips in a tip jar, et cetera. Um, I just can't hear anything. That's the only thing. I can't hear what, you know, there's no audible feedback from people. It's just text and icons. Um, so that's kind of, but, but you know, it's weird. Like I got nervous and I got adrenaline. And I, I, for me, it was like a real show, you know, um, I, I broke a sweat and, you know, I, um, and, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, people can, I can respond to some of the commentary. I mean, sometimes the people send a comment in the middle of a song. I mean, I, I can't say anything back, but that would be true in a normal show anyway. Um, the only thing I can say is that, wow, I've been like, you know, fighting in my solo shows for, 20 odd years to have a completely silent audience and I got my wishes. So I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about your creative process and just kind of, I mean, ask you what that looks like for you. The creative process is not limited to my own music. I'm constantly having to sort of come up with, I mean, we can call them solutions, but they're kind of, um, you know, uh, to, to put it in the simplest phrase, I got to make stuff that's good and I got to make good stuff better. People send me their music, which could be in many different states of development, um, could be really rough or could be real polished. And in either case, finding a way to go up a level is a challenge. If it's already really polished, you don't want to intrude too much. And if it's our, and if it's really rough, you know, you got to do the work to make that, you know, piece of coal into a diamond. Um, and, and it's all possible. Um, and you know, I also work on stuff a lot. I mean, meaning that my calendar is jam, jam, jammed, and that's cool. That's how I want it. Um, but that just means that every day I've got to be engaged and, and I can't, you know, just muck around and, 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 you know, I've got to come up with cool ideas now 
and execute them. Um, and there's something really cool about that. You know, when they, you know, the, the phrase, you know, you want something done correctly, ask a busy person. Um, there is a thing about, you know, that, that you're, you don't overthink ideas and you just, you know, because to be honest, like, and this is what it's always weird when I start to work with other people who are more hesitant and a little more, you know, they doubt more. And, it, and it's really like, ah, you've got too much time in your hands. Um, so, cause I just, I just don't doubt my ideas. I don't have time to go, Oh, I'm not sure. Mm, uh, I can't, I just said, okay, this probably will work. Let's find a way to make it work. You know, and sometimes I play a part and it's, almost there and it needs some tweaking but generally it can be pushed and polished and 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 massaged and and adapted to 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 to, to be the right thing um i think it it's true that my musical instincts are are pretty honed because i'm always working um and you know i get and i get the feedback of what seems to make people you know happy um but I think it's, it's just, you know, that, you know, you, once you get in the zone, you're in the zone and you just don't, you don't overthink it. So when I start to make my own music, uh, if I work with my band, you know, I, I kind of come with that kind of parameter already established. So I, you know, I, I tend to push things through, uh, I'm, I'm always up for like, okay, we, this is good. It's, we're moving on. And my bandmates are, are not necessarily the same. In fact, I would say that we, you know, my my other songwriting partner is at the opposite extreme of that and our drummer is somewhere in the middle uh, of, of the two poles. Um, and with that kind of team, you can get some pretty interesting results um, because my bandmate will does not like to rush through things and he likes to take time. Um, and he threw, that's his way, you know, when he gets to, considering something and turning it over in his head and, and comes back, you know, his ideas are good, you know? Um, so when we would have missed them, if we'd only done it my way, you see what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I think that, and you know, it's weird because, you know, I've been in other bands um, and I can say that um, I think it's kind of true because for a number of reasons, which I can explore, but to make it simple, I think I think the stars align really like once in your life. If you're uh, if you're an artist and you have that great collaboration, um, I think it's really and I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was true in many other art forms. You know, actor director, uh, director screenwriter. You know, that some we're. I think creative people and people in general, people who work in an office, whatever, um, uh, you know, are adaptable and we can all work in teams and stuff like that. I mean, not everybody is a team player, but, you know, most people are pretty flexible. But once or twice in your life, you have, you meet somebody who, who you, you just kind of, you, you don't have to make it work kind of thing. Uh, you just kind of stuff happens and it's good. Um, and, you know, with my bandmate, of course, you know, we've had conflicts and we've had, you know, we've known each other and worked together for 30 years. It's not like it's, everything is smooth sailing and it just works all the time. There is also work to be done in that partnership, but this, but the basis, the, 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 the starting point for what we produce tends to be at a very high level. And it's a very interesting mix of personalities uh, even just the two of us, but also when we've had other musicians in the band. Has your creative process working with the band changed any uh, due to the pandemic? I mean, outside of just the like physical aspect? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's slowed everything down. Um, you know, I mean, the, the pandemic thing has been uh, kind of, oddly beneficial for my studio work. Um, I think people have some time on their hands and they, they're, they're kind of like feeling this, well, I should, you know, the, the thing I've always wanted to do, I should do it. Um, a little bit of like, uh, I don't know, maybe people feel like there's no tomorrow or whatever. So they're trying to like, 
leave their mark on this world. And whatever the motivation is, people have been wanting to do projects and I've been working like crazy. So that's slowed me down a little bit. Um, a, but also I think just in general, things are slow. The, the person we're working with mixing, everything just seems to be a little bit slower. And also there's no kind of urgency, you know, originally we might've wanted to have this record ready and wrapped up by, you know, around this time so we could get on the road, you know, maybe, or get it out before the year's over, get on the road early 2021, blah, blah, blah. None of that uh, seems urgent right now. And it just doesn't, we don't know really when live music will be dependent, de dependably reestablished. Uh, so there's really no hurry. Um, you know, I mean, I'm all for trying things as a, a kind of guinea pig for, for myself. You know, I am playing a live show with an audience um, in Germany next month. Um, at least, you know, that's what, that's what's happening now. I mean, things can change and slip backwards too, but um, I don't know if I really want to do something that experimental for like my bands, you know, once every five years shot at reaching our audience. So I'd rather, I'd probably rather play a few things more safe uh, for the band and our tour, which, you know, presumably is going to be, you know, the, the most um, important in terms of, you know, our, our artistic communication, e economy, everything, uh, thing that we'll do in, in this, you know, in a, in a five to seven year period, we don't, we don't make records very often. So I can't really mess around. So I want to, you know, if we're going to tour, I want to know that live music is kind of, you know, things are working and things are flowing um, rather than, you know, be disappointed and have stuff not work out that we've planned and put a lot of energy to and promotion energy, which, you know, you kind of, it's hard. To, you can't, you can't, you can, the squeaky wheel gets the grease only if the squeaky wheel doesn't squeak too often. I mean, do you find yourself gravitating towards any new themes within songwriting due to the pandemic? Or do you find that um, themes that you've written about, you're still exploring? I, I think that, that yeah, the, the, the themes of today, which aren't just limited to the pandemic, but I, I think it's all related. I, I think that the kind of um, cusp of change that, that we find ourselves on where what's on the other side of that cusp is still rather undefined. There's, you know, lots of social agitation and dispute about how society in this country and in other countries is gonna go from this point. And the, the pandemic is, has been kind of an accelerant because I think the, the pandemic is already introducing all this change. And I think a lot of people don't like change. Um, I think most people are wary of, of changes. And I think that's why, and I'm, I'm gonna, I know I'm on a bit of a tangent, but I will wrap it up, don't worry. I think that's why that, you know, for example, the prevalence of like conspiracy theories and things like that is really like erupted during this time. Um, I think that that's just human nature. Every, for as long as there's been an unknown, humans make myths about it. It's kind of, you know, how we, myths are something you can control. You, you define the myth, you know, uh, something's rumbling on the top of the mountain. You give the God a name and you give the God a backstory and then it's kind of yours. It's in a world that you know about their personalities and they do things for a reason as, a, as, as a, you know, when people didn't understand what made lightning and thunder, what, you know, 4,000 years ago, there's something out of their control. So you make a myth and you can kind of control it. And I think the same thing kind of happens today. So all of those kind of factors that, that there's so much agitation um, and, and of course fear, it, the byproduct of fear is always anger. And if you wonder why people are so angry these days and, and it's so irrational, I think, you know, don't look any further than I think at a baseline, many, many people are really afraid and it's kind of contagious. And it's not like they would ever admit that. Most people don't want to say I'm afraid. Um, so it just gets worse. So in that atmosphere, yeah, sure. I mean, there's things to comment about and there, are, you know, I've done some collaborative songwriting 
And sometimes those kind of themes come out. Um, and I keep thinking, you know, because some of these songs, you know, I like sometimes people have sort of, they want me to, as a, I'm a producer, but they, I become kind of part of the artistic process in the sense that they might only be able to do certain things in their music. Like they can play guitar, but they can't really sing. So they kind of have come up with some music, but they can't do all the stuff 360 degrees that will make it a song. And so I, they hire me to finish it, including writing lyrics and singing in some cases. Um, and that's fine. So some of these collaborations that I've done have themes that are very topical and I did them in say like maybe May and they haven't been released yet. And I keep thinking, well, it's too bad because the moment is going to pass and the song won't be relevant anymore. And then I, now like it's August, I'm like, it's completely relevant. Probably will, you know, can probably release the song a year from now and it'll be relevant. Sad to say, but yeah, I don't, I haven't written a song specifically about the pandemic, but the, the way that I write in general is of course that, you know, I, make my observations of the world and then it gets chopped up and comes out in different ways. I mean, the imagery that, that goes into a song about anything might come not, you know, I could be writing a love song to my wife, but an image might come from something else in life that, that works its way in there that, you know, songs are weird that way. They, they don't have to be just about one thing for the entire, you know, 25 lines of the tune. So, um, I mean, is there a particular album or song or work in general that that you have that really resonates with you over some others? You mean of stuff I've been working on myself lately? It doesn't have to be lately, just anything over the course of your career. Which... You mean, are there th things of my own career that I consider? That, yeah, it still resonates with you over others. Um, well, I have to say that um, I, I, I have kind of um, a, a pretty high bar for what I commit to because my commitment to anything is kind of total. So when I work on something, um, it would be pretty unlikely that I would just like, okay, I've just got to play a thing, get it over with and get out the door. And I just don't, I don't really think that way. I, 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 really you know every song even if it's something kind of even if the band doesn't even care about it that much or the artist or whatever you know i'm still gonna put as much care as possible so there aren't really a lot of things that 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 fall by the wayside i i mean that that mean that, that would mean that other things stand out because they're you know so much more um i have so much they've stayed with me or something like that i think all the stuff that i've worked on believe it or not i mean hundreds of albums i can find stuff that i go like yeah that's you know i, I still believe that that's 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 where i'm at um even even 10 years 20 years after the fact um i think that the kind of projects that find me and the kind of projects that i find are, are things that I naturally resonate with. It's just kind of works out that way. I'm, I'm just not working on BS, you know, not working on stuff that, that, that doesn't inspire my passion. It just doesn't, those people just don't even call me. They somehow they know psychically that I'm not the guy. Um, so, I mean, there's moment, there's lots of little moments in records that I've done that I think it's really about that too. Cause, cause also, Records, recordings, ever is, are about moments, and especially the way that we make music now, you know, where, uh, you know, we're working on, it's kind of like making animation, you know, we're working pixel by pixel, in certain cases, on songs, you know, if it's electronic music, at least for me, the way I make electronic music is that there's millions of tiny events, um, you know, so that, that if you step back a bit, it all kind of flows. But if you look at it up close, there's just these, all these kind of little things interacting. I don't really work in loops, which is how a lot of electronic musicians work. Um, if that makes sense. A lot of, well, there's a lot of electronic musicians loop 
you know, a, a four bar phrase and then they kind of mutate it over time. Whereas me, I really make, there's very little repetition in my electronic music. It's more like electronic composition, something, I mean, I'm not gonna say I'm as good as Johann Sebastian Bach, but I'm not, but it's the same kind of theory of things happening in sequence um, that, that, that rather than, than loops repeating and, and you get into like a trancey thing. I could do that, I just tend to gravitate the other way. So that being that music is made out of moments, um, and and th I think that there's, you know, I've put myself 100% into practically every record I've worked with. So, so in some cases, maybe the artist pulled back and said, "Okay, th this guy's 100% is sticking out too much, so I'm going to shave it back." Uh, that that can happen. Maybe you know, I didn't fit because I was, you know, I gave too much information in a sense and it's distorting the whole picture so i need to be pushed back in the mix a bit blah 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 anyway uh what i'm saying is that the uh, yeah on pretty much everything i've worked on you'll find moments that i could go like yes that is exactly what i wanted to achieve and it's weird because it's like it, you scratch an itch in those cases and it could be something as dumb as like ah oh, i got the right bass sound ah oh, finally you know and, and then but then the the satisfaction of that moment gone next song you go oh, i gotta get the great the great bass sound again and, ah the same sound didn't work with this song ah crap um so i don't know i mean i mean i you know i think the 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 solo albums that i've done are, are a good place to you know get to know me because um i've had kind of very little interference i mean i didn't really work with producers i kind of directed the whole thing and so I'm, I'm pretty much responsible for that content. Um, and I think those records hold up. There's, I have four solo records that I've made over the last 25 years and, and they're all four are quite different and all four are quite cool. I think there's really, really nice stuff in there. They're a little eccentric, but also m musically very sound. There's really, really good, very, you know, respected musicians playing on them, but it's not, I don't have any commercial goal with my solo music, really. I, I, I don't, so I don't need to compete at the level that would start to make me more generic. So it goes the other way. I mean, my music, my music is, is kind of well-crafted and a little bit quirky, you know? And if you like that kind of thing, um, I think there's a lot to chew on in those records. Do you think that the pursuit of commercial of that commercial sound for a lot or for some musicians can bog down what they what they end up producing. I, I mean, I don't know about bog down, but um, my only thing when I'm when I'm working as a producer and they like I remember I was working with a guy. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not particularly ageist myself, and I don't like the idea that you know you can only be a great artist when you're young which you know if you know a thing or two about novelists you'd find that really stupid um you know and mus good musicians are often a little bit like novelists and they can be great you know until they're 100 years old but um we have some cultural and commercial aspects uh, you sell more products when you're, you're young and thin so People, you know, the co-branding that happens with younger musicians, blah, 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 blah. You, know, you see where I'm going with this. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to leave that word as just to say that, that I'm not ageist, but a lot of the musical and outside of the musical world is ageist. Um, so, but also um, the time it takes to build up your craft, it's something that it's a little, anything is possible, but I would tailor one's goals accordingly, depending on when I started and when I got into things. So, so, you know, I've done a couple records with people who, you know, they played in bands when they were in their twenties and then they got involved in another profession and then they're coming to me in their late forties or fifties wanting to make a record. And one of these people was, was like, um, you know, I want this to sound like Coldplay and I want to get, you know, on commercial radio and all this stuff. And I'm like, it's just never going to happen. I'm really sorry, but it's never gonna happen. You don't have the resources to compete at that level, knowing that like, whether even if payola is illegal, it happens. Like you gotta pay somebody to walk your stuff in the door and the, the, if 
you're going for commercial radio, the walk in the door is six figures. It's just, that's just how it works. We don't like to think of it that way, but that's how it works. And there's all the other stuff that goes with it. You got to have a live following and blah, 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 blah. It's not like you're going to write a song that by the way, doesn't sound anything like Coldplay and then think that you're going to suddenly being up. This was a few years ago when Coldplay was at the top of their game. This is why he brought up that reference. Um, and I was just like, it's not going to happen. And, and anyway, like why, if we beat our heads against the wall, trying to make something that competes with people who are at the top of the charts, who have all these other things going on in their favor, like knowing that we probably won't get there, like we're wasting all, like, why not just make a record that you like? You know, like, I mean, at this point, if you don't make it into the charts and you make a record that doesn't really reflect you, then you, you're basically left with nothing, but you had a fun time spending 70 grand. But if we make a record that reflects you, that will be there forever, you know, for your kids, for your grandkids, for anybody, you know, and, and it won't, we won't, we're going to spend like seven grand, you know I mean? Like it's just seems like this kind of thing. So I, I think like the idea that everything has to be commercial, I think also what's weird to me is it, that idea that everything is a product, which didn't exist when I was younger, but I think really exists now has warped, you know, the music, I think of young people, especially to be way more bland, you know, um, and, and way more samey. And I, I know I could just be an old grandpa thinking, Oh, today's music all sounds the same. Um, but you know, I see bands and now these bands, I mean, I'm, I'm not even talking about people who are really young, like teenagers or 20 somethings, but you know, bands that have, are one generation under me. So people are now in their thirties and forties. And I think like, gosh, you know, like everything is so it's, it's skill. You know, they, these are bands with real instruments. Everything is real skillful. They play well, they sing, everything's in tune. It's all nice. And I'm like, please somebody do something irrational, please. Otherwise like, I just can't even get through two minutes of it. You know, like I, I'm, there are there are people who are making wild, crazy, scary music out there. They definitely exist, and they exist at all ages. Uh, I'm just saying that that the, the idea that I, I feel like sometimes bands make their music for the idea that they might end up in a car commercial or in a film placement, and I think that's somebody's got to kickstart the creative process and do something completely original otherwise things will just plateau you know somebody has to come along and shake it up um and so i think that everybody trying to fit in is a bad idea um i mean i'm speaking in huge generalities but your question was also quite broad so uh there's your response um so where did you or when did you start to really come to that idea that you wanted music that where something ir irrational happened like where did you start to really uh, go on that trail well I think I've always been that way I think that's what I like to listen to um you know I mean I I listened when I was a kid or teenager or whatever I listened to some commercial music um you know maybe by the time I was, it all, some pretty interesting things had, interesting artists were having hits from the time I was 13, 14, like The Clash or David Bowie. Uh, you know, these people were having like huge hits. So it was kind of a weird world at that time. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of left, I, 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 I absorbed all there was from, you know, the beginnings of rock music up until my present day, 40 years ago. And then I was like, well, now what, you know, and then what was coming up in the underground, there was just a huge variety of things happening. And I just, you know, wanted to try and understand it all and see what people were up to. I think that's my whole thing is I just like to know what people are up to. And sometimes when it's really, you know, when it's really commercial, the people kind of have to, you know, you kind of have to mask your personality a bit to make it more general. And then, I'm like, well, I don't know who that person is. So it's not very interesting. I think that's, that's kind of just 
how it's always been for me. I want to see the real person. Sometimes, you know, I mean, David Bowie has got some pretty unusual ideas and he's certainly not afraid to do some strange things in his career. And, you know, 1983, he was the biggest artist on the planet. You know, next, well, 1983, yes, 1982 was Michael Jackson, who is also very weird. Um, you know what I mean? But when you actually, when you really think about it, um, some of these people, you know, Michael Jackson, David Bowie, Prince, you know, who are these icons. Um, and I don't think it was just fame that made them weird. I think they were, they were unusual people and they had unusual perspectives and it gave them a, a particular flavor. You know, they weren't, they weren't imitators. They, they are people that, that, that people still imitate. Uh, and I'm not talking just about, you know, people on Hollywood Boulevard doing moonwalks. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about like musically, like look to as a, as a, as a kind of guidepost, you know? Um, so that, you know, that, that shows you something right there. There's a, there's like this whole middle ground of schmaltz that's, you know, people who sell lots of records and they're, you know, they do, they do all the right things um, and they hit all the right marks for the, their generation and blah, blah, blah. Above that, you have the true icons, the ones that will always, you know, be selling records, t-shirts, people will always, you know, the, the Kurt Cobain's and like I said, Prince and blah, 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 blah. People will always look to these people for the next hundred years. Um, and uh, so that's the high, highest level. And they're all originals. You know, I'm, I'm sure they do covers and whatever. I mean, they're musicians too, but they, they have a stamp and they have a, they have quirks, you know, they can't, they can't just smooth it out and do something quirk free. They can do stuff that's nice, but it's not quirk free. And that's, I'd rather align myself with that kind of thinking and just, Hey, I'm a weird guy. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm also, we're all kind of weird. I mean, everybody got something in their head that they probably feel embarrassed to share or something like that. I mean, not because it's wrong, just because it's different, whatever. Some people are more open about it than others. Um, but I think, you know, as time goes on, uh, I personally, you know, at, now we open up another thing, which is, you know, I grew up in this small town and being different in any way even if people didn't really understand what it was that was different about you, and even if I didn't understand what it was that was different about me, I mean, uh, was a source of, you know, people just instinctually wanted to, you know, rub that out. You know, nonconformity was a bad, bad thing in the, my small town in 1982. And I found that out very much the hard way. Uh, and I, you know, just saw that there's this wheel turning where where acceptance and, and tolerance were possible. Um, and, you know, bands that I that were tiny little underground bands that I started to like got popular. So that, hey, there's more, there's there's a lot of people like me out there, you know. Um, and then the then the the bands that I was friends with or listening to became the mainstream. And then I thought, well, gosh, you know, it's really just a my generation just needed to get to where it's going, but we still have problems. The human, the humans with the, with the tolerance and the, and the um, acceptance and, and, and um, you know, there's always a, a for uh, a, a battleground, uh, uh, the forefront or the, the, the avant-garde of, of not just art, but of just of living um, and how you live and, and, and that, you know, you might have to, I think what, what drives people crazy is that at the end of the day, uh, you might have to look every person at every person as an individual and that they won't fit into all the categories that make everything so much easier for some people. There's a lot of shorthands we can use. If, if you look a certain way, if you act a certain way, um, if you dress a certain way, if you do this or that, okay, you're, you're a blah, blah, blah. And we make all these shortcuts because it's exhausting to take human beings into account one by one. But unfortunately, 
that's how we are. We are one by one. I mean, I, I may have a certain skin color and I may have come from a certain region, but I'm no more, I mean, I'm only superficially alike other people of my region, my skin color, my age, my gender, whatever, or perceived gender, whatever you want to call it. Unfortunately, you had to take everybody one at a time. And a lot of people are just too fucking lazy to do it. And that, that's just how I feel. And I, I, I really think that if you take people one on one, and if you listen to them and actually take the time to, to just listen to them, you, you, it's hard not to develop empathy for people. Uh, and I'm not just talking about people on the forefront of social change right now. I'm talking about any person, conservative, liberal, any race, any religion, foreign, domestic, whatever, um, you know, take them one at a time. And then suddenly they're not, they're not one of those blah, blah, blahs, you know, it works a little bit when you, you know, when you have kids and it turns out when you, your kids has a very different way of, of living than you and they're still your child and you have to like reconcile that. But sometimes you don't have that eye-opening experience. So you need to go out and get it which is hard because if you're not used to opening your eyes, the world just looks like a place you want to want to see less of because it's got so much ugliness in it. But the opening of the eyes is how we make it less ugly. When the more you look at the world, the more beauty you can find, even amongst all the cruelty and, and ugliness. What are some things you feel inspired by generally? But I also uh -huh. want to know, on the other hand, if you feel inspired by other artistic mediums. So the answer is yes. Um, I don't come into a huge amount of contact with uh, visual art that much. So except for uh, film, um, film, you know, I've, I've, and, and what I like about film and I think, um, you know, we were kind of talking about this in the last question and I'm, I, it, it bridges well into this question. My whole life, is kind of uh, been a quest to to understand other people and also find my place in the world um, and feel less uh, alone in a sense that 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 yes we're all alone but if 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 that's the case then we're united at least in that and we can also find our our you know people who shared similar experiences and and you know you kind of can build on that a little bit. Whereas if you're just, if you feel isolated and alone, which was really, you know, I, I have had some wonders if I might have some slight, a toe or two into the spectrum, for example. And, and the whole thing about that is, is that you're not quite plugged into the human race the same way as it seems like many other people are emotionally, communication wise, perception wise, et cetera. Uh, it's like, a, I think I have a little bit of color blindness in terms of, of sociality. Um, and that's a hard thing to detect because if you're colorblind, sometimes it's hard to know that you're colorblind because you don't know what you're missing, um, shall we say. So all my life I've been, you know, trying to figure out who's out there and, and, and how can I better integrate into this world and music was the thing that stuck out to me at like age four when I'd already started, you know, I started school at age four and I just didn't understand anything. I didn't understand what anybody was about. I could not communicate very well. I was really isolated. Um, and music was something that I heard and I go, I know exactly what these people are talking about. And, and you, this was, you know, my parents' music collection was largely classical, so it's mostly instrumental music, but I was like, I know what this person was thinking. I can feel it. They're telling me a story and I can see it as if it's plain as day, as if they're writing it to me in words and putting a piece of paper right in front of me. And so I thought, this is a great tool. Um, I, how could I resist, you know? And so I went from there. And since then, you know, especially like, as I mentioned, living in this little town where, you know, a, there was a lot of closed minds and, you know, sometimes an open mind was rejected rather violently. Uh, so um, you didn't want to stick out, but I thought I was like living there going, there's gotta be more to life than this place. And music, literature, 
and film were, you know, the, the indications that there were people who thought about things as, shall we say, with as much detail as I cared to. I think it's a matter of care and interest. And I think it's a matter of capacity for information, for lack of a better word. I, I'm not trying to say that other people are dumb. I think some people just don't want to deal with too much information. We already talked about that a little bit. Um, so it's more in a sense a matter of choice. Although, yeah, some people are smarter than others, but everybody has a potential to, to, to grow. Um, as far as I, as far as I've seen, even people with real, real developmental problems can grow a little bit and they try, you know, and so everybody's got room to grow a little bit. Um, and a lot of us have room to grow a lot and many people choose to keep it small. Um, so there's that. So in music, literature, film, I found people who didn't want to keep it small. They wanted to put in all the details, you know, and make and create worlds with immense amounts of information and so yeah that's i was like that's where i want to be i want to be in, in 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 those people's world i want to be one of those people and i want to leave a big pile of information so that somebody else like me down the road is who craves detail and information will go wow here's a detailed world i can go into this and i can experience it and then i can take that energy and, and grow my own world from it, perhaps. Um, so uh, in, um, in the world of film, I mean, there are filmmakers who, who create very unique worlds. Um, and then there are also films that I love that just show us little glimpses into the, uh, the real world, the quotidian world uh, outside of my immediate experience. You know, I could watch a film that's just about daily life in some part of the world I've never been, you know, Mozambique or Fiji or something like this and just see how people live. And you, it could be a fairly um, down to earth kind of drama, but you, you see the, the, that there's another part of the world with a, another atmosphere. And yet, you know, these people are human beings and they have their problems and you can relate to those problems. I love those kind of things too. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I have a lot of interests. Um, so music obviously isn't going to satisfy all of those interests. Um, so, and to be honest, I've always been um, quite into uh, observing the natural world. You know, I was very much into roaming the woods when I was a kid and, and looking at strange creatures that I would find and going and reading about them and what is that and how does it, you know, live and blah, blah, blah. Um, and nature has lots to offer uh, too in terms of, of inspiration. And, and I'm very inspired by the natural world because also like the world of people, it can be exhausting. <laughs> um, nature has very simple agendas and you can learn what those agendas are and, and you can, it, nature tends I mean, there are deceptions in nature, you know, there are creatures that look like other creatures, but they aren't. And then there's camouflage and they can hide somewhere and eat you or whatever. Um, sure. But th they're kind of one dimensional and they're with a specific goal in mind. Whereas human beings pathologically can have very obscure goals and, and be very deceptive. And, and sometimes, you know, I've had to deal with people like that and it's a nightmare because at the, if you really dig in and try and understand them, you're like, I just, they, their goal doesn't make any sense to me. Why do they spend so much time and energy hurting people? It doesn't make any sense. I, I can see why they are hurt, but I cannot see why they want to replicate that. Um, this kind of thing. So, you know, the nature, the natural world is a good um, vacation from the world of human psychology. So there's that too, but that does make it into my art, you know, like I, I, I'm, I know there's a bigger world always. And this is also something that makes me a little bit less afraid, you know, and I, I love traveling. So I've done a lot of traveling and, and I put music into that travel. I usually go somewhere every year where I've never been and play a show this year. It's a little complicated, um, but it's not over yet. Um, so, but you know, I've been to many, many places where, you know, practically no one 
certainly no one like an indie rock musician has has ever been to play a show. Um, I can say that with a certitude in, in certain countries. Um, and then, you know, just, and it, again, people are people and, and it's, it, but it makes the world smaller. And that, that's just kind of, that's kind of it for me. Anything that, that, that um, shows me there's a bigger world out there and yet at the same time brings that bigger world a little bit closer to me, that's, that's what my life is all about. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say or add that I haven't asked you about? Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I will be doing, um, you know, I do these online concerts. I have one coming up on August 30th. Um, that's not at a very good time for people in the United States. Um, but I'm going to be doing another one September 5th. Let me just check that, that calendar. Yes. September 5th. That should be like a you know morning midday time for most people in the states. Um, if you go to my Instagram at Ken Stringfellow, there's in the bio the link is a link tree, and I always have the latest shows in there. And so check it out. A little self promotion never hurts. Um, that's really about it. I'm of course if people you know want to work with me as a producer, musician, whatever, I'm super easy to find via that Instagram. KenStrinkle.com, blah, 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 blah. I have a beautiful studio in Seattle where I spend part of the year. And I have a home studio in Europe where I spend part of the year. Always looking for interesting projects. Never hesitate to hit me up. Awesome. Also, thank you for taking the time to do this podcast with me. My pleasure. Thanks for thinking of me.